This morning, our scripture comes from Matthew 2, verses 12 through 23. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because there are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth, so was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he could be called a Nazarene. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. It is such a joy to be here today. I'm very, very thankful that uh, David would uh, ask me to come. There's only uh, 52 of these in the year, so... I'm very honored to be here today. Uh, It is my home church, and I'm so so glad to see uh, my family and friends for so many years, my cousins and uncles. It's so good to be here today. So today, I want to talk about God's mission on earth and how God will bring you into that mission. And I'll start with this title, all right? So what happened was on Sunday night last week, uh, Tammy messaged me and said, okay, if you could have the title and scripture by tomorrow on Monday, uh, I could bring it in, of course. Yeah, on Wednesday, yeah. So, okay, so my normal routine was to uh, have it in a little later. Usually it's like Thursday, an hour before the secretary leaves and says, Brooks, do you have your sermon title? I'm like, I know. So uh, having it a week uh, before was uh, pretty challenging. And so I was thinking on Monday night, what do I title this? And the only thing I could come up with is, Jesus be like 2020, my dudes. It's a new year, right? It's 2020. 2019. 1999, Y2K, never happened. Don't think it's going to happen. It's a disappointment. But today is a new year. Anyone looking forward to a new year? Yeah? All right. So I want to share, uh, break down this title. Um, There's this popular meme on uh, social media uh, where it's like, so-and-so be like, right? Uh, is, Is anyone familiar with that? I know you might see someone... You know, uh, Donald Trump, be like. Uh, some football coach, be like. And if you don't know what a meme is, just never never mind. Uh, it's on social media. Just don't call it a meme or meme, okay? It's, uh, I think it's meme, but no one really knows. So I shared that. And if you weren't uh, familiar with social media, uh, you might not know what I'm talking about. Oh, that's a reference uh, I don't get. I'll just read over it. Now, everyone knows what 2020, that re- what it, uh, of which it references, correct? Yeah, New Year. Then I have this uh, last part of the, uh, the title, My Dudes. Uh, only people on Tex Ags reference that, right? Now, Jason Jones knows my reference, correct? 
giga, right? So it goes back to this message board. Uh, uh, Tex Hags is recruiting Christians. Like, I can't believe you referenced this because I'm always on it, right? And only Jason and I would get it, or maybe a few others. Maybe the packs, I don't know. Yes, yeah, yeah. I giggle. <laughs> right, so, so here's the point. It is a specific reference within an ongoing conversation from a unique community. I want to say it again. It is a specific reference in an ongoing story. Communication story from a very specific community. Now, today, when we read the Gospel of Matthew, that's what we find because uh, when you read Matthew, Matthew has uh, these references to the Old Testament. Uh, when you read on, you might see something like, like we read today, and this fulfills what it was, you know, said by the prophet Jeremiah, the prophet Isaiah. Right? We read two or three of those today. So Matthew has these little markers, these little codes. And what Matthew wants to do is he wants to connect the story of Jesus, the events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and the ascension going on everlasting, to the story of Israel. Everybody knew it. We may not be familiar with it, but everybody in his community would have, okay, I got it. Matthew wants to connect the gospel, the story, the good news of Jesus with the reference of the Old Testament so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by grace through faith, he may connect your life with that greater story. Now, uh, does anyone uh, remember, you know, just recently this passage that we read? Does it sound familiar? Yeah, David, David we, it was last week, right? So in no way does this contradict uh, the sermon last week. In, in a way, I, I want to support it because I want to go uh, behind it. Uh, this is the background to the passage. Okay, and what I want to do is share several things. The first thing I want to do is talk about the events here that we read in the Gospel of Matthew. And then I want to share several things from the Old Testament, his references. Uh, and then, I hope, by the grace of God, you may connect your life to that greater story so that you may go into this new year fulfilling God's mission. Amen? Amen. You want to fulfill God's mission? Amen. All right, let's do it. Okay, so what do we find in this story? Uh, the first thing we find is, of course, Matthew is connecting it to the Old Testament. We have several, several characters here. Um, they are alerted by dreams, right? Uh, the Magi in verse 12, right? There's dreams everywhere, right? The Magi are awakened. They are warned to leave and don't go see Herod because he wants to kill uh, the young Jesus. Uh, then we have dreams for Joseph, so Jesus, I mean, excuse me, Joseph is awakened. Uh, you need to get out of here because Herod wants to kill uh, the baby Jesus. So go and take the child and his mother and go to Egypt. And when you're in Egypt, wait for my word. He's awakened in a dream, right, in Egypt and said, okay, you can come back now. It's safe. Now what Joseph represents is a model of discipleship. In the birth narrative, Mary is the model of hearing and responding to God's word and God's promise. Uh, it's a little clearer in the Gospel of Luke. A little more is, uh, is shared about her experience there, the uh, Magnificat her response, Let it be unto me, a servant of the Lord, according to your word. Mary is the model of how we should respond to God's uh, presence in our life. And now here Joseph is the model. Now an angel and Joseph and Herod are the main characters. Did you notice that the only reference to Jesus is that child, this child, and his mother? So we have the birth narrative that changes everything in human history everlasting. 
And then we have this next story where it's the child and his mother. So what Matthew may be doing is, is just kind of, uh, kind of pushing that forward because right now we want to focus on Joseph. There's the angels, the messengers, and then there's King uh, Herod, the Pharaoh. King Herod wants to destroy a whole generation of God's people so that he may destroy and prevent what God is doing in the world at that time. Just like Pharaoh wanted to destroy the children, all the sons of the generation enslaved in Egypt. Pharaoh is the villain, the bad guy, the Pharaoh. And here is Joseph. What does Joseph do? He hears, he understands, he responds obediently. He hears, he understands, he responds obediently. Folks, that's the model that we have. Joseph is how we are to live our lives. He is the exemplar. But Matthew also like I referred to, he refers back to the Old Testament. And I want to share quickly four references. The first thing is God's big story. Has anyone completed one of Sandy Richter's uh, studies? It's not the first time here, I know. I am overjoyed uh, that uh, y'all offer Sandy's studies. Uh, Sandy and Steve are dear friends. Uh, I was in Sandy's first class at Asbury. I was in Steve's first class. Uh, they were professors of mine at Wesley Biblical. Um, there is no greater communicator of the story of God's people and redemptive purposes uh, than Sandy Richter uh, from the Old Testament. So if, you've, uh, if you're familiar with Sandy's model, uh, here it is. God originally intended for his people to be in his presence, in his place forevermore. That's it. That's Genesis 1 and 2. God's people, God's place, in God's presence. But, chapter 3, Genesis 3, Adam messed it up. And then we find this story of human rebellion, corruption, pain, sin, and suffering. The story of our age. But then through the hero Jesus. We find God working in history, time and space, bringing his people back into his presence in the place that they will be everlasting to everlasting. Amen? That's her big story. That's the big story of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it's okay to reference every time you teach, every chapter and verse that you teach. God wants to bring his people out of a fallen world, out of a fallen and exiled relationship, back into his presence. The next, uh, the next image we have, Matthew connects the story of Jesus with the Exodus. Now, if you read chapter 3, we find John the Baptist, he's in the Jordan, Jesus gets baptized, and then he goes on with his mission to the cross, resurrection, ascension. What's the story of Israel? God's people are called, they come out of Egypt. What do they walk through? Red Sea. And then they come and make covenant, and what is the river that they walk through? The Jordan. And then they go into what? The promised land, right? What Matthew is saying is that Jesus is like the new Moses, bringing God's people out of Egypt of sin and death and slavery, a spiritual Egypt, through water, hint, hint, baptism, by grace through faith, into a promised land. But it's not a place, per se, a nation like Canaan, a, a small territory. Matthew is saying that this Moses, Jesus actually is the Exodus, is going into the world. That the world has come to be the promised land. And what are we called to do as God's people? To hear, respond, understand, and follow Jesus. To what? 
Make disciples of all those people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what do we do? We're baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to keep all that Jesus has taught us. Have you heard that before, right? The great commission. We are called by God's grace to be empowered through the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus for the transformation of people, for the redemption of God's world. That is what Matthew is connecting us with. Now, Matthew also has two specific references, three, but I'll only mention two. The first reference in uh, chapter 15, out of Egypt, I have called my son. Now, you might uh, have glossed over that. You might not have caught it. Uh, I had to go back and check where, uh, from where that came. It comes from Hosea. It comes from a prophet named Hosea. And I want to read chapter 11 to you. So bear with me, but listen to these images. Hosea chapter 11. <clears throat> when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to Baals, a, a false god. And they burned incense to false images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them? Because they refuse to repent, swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars, bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, He will by no means exalt them. How can I hand them over, Israel? How can I hand you over? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zebulun? See, He's referenced their rebellion, but now He's changing His tone. My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate, devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow Yahweh. He will roar like a lion. And when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt. He like droves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel. So Hosea is a prophet. And what God called Hosea to do is to go and uh, marry uh, this woman named Homer. And what uh, God said, marry this woman, but she is going to rebel from you. Okay? And so what the wife did, Homer, what she did is leave, leave the prophet. And what did she do? She sold herself into prostitution. She sold herself into a life that didn't honor, didn't honor a main character. And out of the midst of the shame, the disgrace, the horror, God then said, Hosea, go back and buy your wife in public. Bring her back to you. Redeem her from foreign men. They had children. She should have realized I'm blessed they have sons they have an abundance of children in those days she would have looked like she is blessed among women 
And what did she do? She rebelled again. And so there's this cycle. She rebels. She sells herself. Homer, who loves her dearly, goes, brings her back. And so what the prophet is saying, and what Matthew wants to communicate, is simply, there is an, an unfailing love despite repeated transgressions. Did you hear that? There is an unfailing love despite what this rebellion covenant partner does. Do you hear me? An unfailing love. God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has an unfailing love for His covenant people. When they rebel, when they go astray, God continues to love them and call them and woo them. And we can't can't stop this love. It doesn't matter what we do. This love, this covenant love is unfailing. Do you hear me, church? The next image we have is this image from Jeremiah. And it comes from verse 18. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be confronted because they are no more. Matthew wants to connect the story of Jesus to this story of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah. And I want want you to hear some of the images. There will be a day when watchmen cry out, on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion to Yahweh our God. This is what Yahweh says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of nations. Talking about Israel. Make your praises heard and say, Oh, Yahweh, save your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers and women in labor. A great throng will return. They will come weeping with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble because I am Israel's father and Ephraim, the people of Israel, is my firstborn. Hear the word of Yahweh, O nations. Proclaim it to the distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd for Yahweh will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. What is the message here? The message that Jeremiah is communicating is that God will bring His people who are carried away into exile. He will bring them back. Even though it looks like they will never come home, He alone has this promise that He will bring them back. Simply, there is a promise to return Despite everything you see, despite your situation, despite what you have done, despite what people have done to you, despite your trauma, there is a promise of God's return to bring you home. So what's the message that Jesus here in chapter 2 of Matthew wants you to know? Do you normally play? Okay, all right. Hold it for suspense. Here's the basic message of the gospel. There is an unfailing love for you, for me, no matter what happens, no matter where you go. God will never give up bringing you back into his presence, into the place where you are to dwell evermore. No matter what happens to you, no matter where you go, 
There is a promise. Do you hear me, church? There is a promise of peace and love and grace from the God of pure love. Do you get it? Do you hear? Will you respond? How many of you have already made New Year's resolutions? Right? You can raise your hand. I don't want to be the only one, right? Right, it's just like part of our culture, right? It's part of what we do as Americans. Here's the new year. We want to change. We want to have a better year for ourselves, for our family. We want to lose weight. We want to eat healthy. Well, how about we trade the burden, the weight of sin from which we are held down. And we trade it for the light in the good yoke of Jesus Christ. Have you heard that before? Matthew, Luke, John, Mark says let's trade that weight you know you are to lose for the yoke of Jesus that is good and true so that you may go into the world transformed, listening, responding, obedient. We want to exercise, right? Who wants to exercise more? Yeah, I said, I'm going to run. I'm going to run January 1st. I'm going to run January 2nd. Uh, I couldn't run the 3rd or uh, today because we're traveling. I'm going to run the 4th, right? Well, guess what? It's January 5th, and I've already blown it. I want to eat better, but uh, I, I've already blown it, especially yesterday. It's our twins' birthday. I, I have blown it. How about, rather than pulling ourselves up, rather than trying to do this ourselves, how about we let the grace of the Holy Spirit transform our lives? The Father sent the Son and the Spirit of whom fills and guides and leads and empowers, from whom we move by grace through faith into a new life. How about letting that grace transform you, fill you, and empower you? Baptize you in His power. I need it. Do you need it? I've got to start there because I've already failed. God is roaring like a lion for His people and He wants to bring you back. That's His will and it never changes. Do you hear it? Can you hear those echoes from the garden? God is roaring through the person of Jesus. Do you want it, church? Amen? Do you want it? We come to this table today, and this is the place from which we may begin. This is the sacrament of which changes our lives. This is a slam dunk by grace through faith for the transformation of your life. This is where I've got to come. This is where we start. So today, as Tammy leads us so well, and you have an incredible, incredible pastor here, come to this table and receive, hear and respond God speaking to you. And receive God's grace. Amen, church? Let's come. Amen.